So, um, Mr. Lombardo, um, you talked about uh, risk adjustment and how uh, it uh, negates some possible consequences. What percentage of actual costs are mitigated through the risk adjustment process that's in place? Um, are you speaking to the CMS risk adjustment program? Or are you talking about <coughs> So, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, you, because you have healthier members, have been cutting, been basically paying money in, but your competitor is receiving money back yep. through that risk adjustment. So what percentage of uh, actual uh, variation due to the health status of your members actually gets um, taken care of through that risk adjustment process? Our, our assumption is that the risk adjustment program is solving for any of those um, inequities in the market between MVP and our competitor. Uh, I, I will point to, we do have an exhibit in our rate filing where we quantify what the percentage actually is that we're paying to risk adjustment as a percent of our projected claim cost. It's on exhibit three, which may take me a minute to find. Exhibit two of the binder, page 138. We are projecting a risk adjustment program payment of $60. That's prior to that one. Let's get there first. Okay. So prior to any L and E recommendations. We were projecting a $60.53 PMPM payment into the risk adjustment program <coughs> to the index rate prior to uh, risk adjustment in line 30 of $414. The adjustment is somewhere just south of 15%. With the recommendation of L&E, we'd add another 1.5%. talked about 40% uh, of the hospital business being done at hospitals that so aren't under the regulatory authority of the Rebound Care Board. Uh, of that 40%, what percentage would be Vermont hospitals, specifically um, Brattleboro Retreat um, and the state hospital, um, that we do not uh, have that regulatory authority? That's actually included in the um, confidential information, I, 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 I believe. Um, it's, what was that, 3A was the one? I don't remember if Yusufur was referencing. Um, it's not a huge impact. Uh, those two facilities in Vermont are driving a lot of the impact of our trend differences. I would like to make one clarifying point, though. The 40% of business that is not governed by the, the board is, med is hospital plus physician costs. So also included in that figure is any of our community physicians that we contract with directly in the state of Vermont. So that's not, I just want to make it clear, that's not 40% of the business is just leaving Vermont. It's a number that's smaller than that if we account for uh, physicians that are not covered by the board. When you look at that trend of the 5.5%, uh, <coughs> do you uh, see any correlation between uh, the regulation in a state on those entities versus the non-regulation? Um, can you clarify exactly what you're looking <clears throat> So if Vermont is growing at half of that, um, 
do you think that has anything to do with um, the oversight of those hospitals? Or do you think that uh, um, it has more to do with what's happening in that particular geographic region? It, we, saw, we see a direct impact of the Green Mountain Care Board being able to match the, the facility trends. Um, we actually put an exhibit together which showed how our premiums have changed since the inception of the ACA over time in a couple of our New York markets relative to Vermont. And what we've been, what we've seen is that the Vermont premium rate increases and just the level has actually dipped below the New York premium levels. Um, they weren't always at that level. And we, we do attribute a large portion of that to the fact that our trends are lower, which is because of um, managing the, the actual facility trends in the, in the facility on position trends by the board. So you, you mentioned that you um, negotiated directly with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Yes. Um, as part of that, um, knowing that 40% of the volume done in Lebanon campus is for monitors, do you try to tie any potential increases to rates that you're seeing in Vermont? That would be a question I'd have to follow up with our, our contracting team. Um, we, we do, I, no surprise, that is the, the one facility that has the most utilization for our members because you know a lot of southern Vermonters go over the border and access care. Um, we are we do we do our best to actually to keep the cost down. It's it's just always challenging to come up with the figures uh, where the board is is holding facilities to the, around three and a half percent. In what states do you uh, negotiate for your own versus using your national carrier? Your national Excluding contract? it's it's New York uh, upstate New York for the most part and then just start with Hitchcock. There may be one or two other facilities that I'm not recalling that are on the border of New York or Vermont, but primarily it's start with Hitchcock and then it's New York. So obviously your national carrier would have negotiations in both those markets as well. Um, have you concluded that because MVP is negotiating directly, with Dartmouth Hitchcock, you're getting a better rate, and therefore that's why you do it that way. Or, what what is the the, the historical decision point that you negotiate with Dartmouth Hitchcock versus using your national carrier? That would be something I'd have to follow up to the specifics with the contracting team. We did MVP being we did operate in the state of New Hampshire uh, in the past. We withdrew from that market due to challenges with keeping costs down, offering a competitive premium rate. Um, a number of years back, we never offered an ACA compliant product, so I believe the exit was around the time of the inception of the ACA in 2014, was around that time. But we, obviously we're still in Vermont, and we recognize how much um, Vermonters, and also New Yorkers for that matter, access Dartmouth Hitchcock, which is my understanding why we continue to negotiate with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Okay. You mentioned in your testimony that uh, you believe that you got the same percentage off that uh, your national law contract carrier receives. Obviously, there's can't staples law, and there's no such thing as a free lunch. So, um, how are how are they compensated for doing the work for you? Is it on a, a, a percentage basis, a fixed fee, or what? The national carrier doesn't have a robust network in upstate New York, so they actually leverage our contracts for their members that want to access care in upstate New York. Um, and then, obviously, and then we leverage their network outside of where we contract. So that it is a two-way relationship between the two uh, carriers. The actual terms of the contract, that would be something that I'm, I'm not privy to, but someone at MVP is privy to that information and can provide it. Are there multiple options for a, a, a national law contract? Other in, in terms of, could we use another carrier? 
So there are other national carriers. I don't know if there's another one that has gaps in their network in upstate New York where um, it would make as much sense, but that would be something that I would have to talk to our contracting team about. Would you assume that your contract team is comparing what the uh, percentages are on the contracts with their different options? So I, I am not, I'm not sure if that information is readily available. I mean, that's one of the, that's a carrier's generally one of their most confidential pieces of information. So I'm not sure how well we have the ability to understand um, the cost of the national carrier that we leverage versus uh, another carrier at specific facilities. Okay. Um, you talked about uh, this board doing an evil thing and making a couple of adjustments mid-year. And uh, I'm just curious because we uh, had this year's filings and one of those adjustments was for a hospital that did not ask for a increase in charges or rates this coming year because uh, a number of carriers had told them that they could not implement um, the mid-year adjustment until October 1. Um, do you know how MVP treated those two uh, mid-year adjustments? Uh, no, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that. My understanding is that it was effective on the date, but I don't know if the actual claims that are processed are reflecting um, those, those adjustments. And did you do any analysis of what percentage of uh, MVP's overall business was affected by those two? We do have an exhibit in our filing that includes, um, it's a confidential exhibit that, that displays utilization of, of MVP services by facility in, in Vermont versus um, Dartmouth Hitchcock, New York participating hospitals in our rental network. So I, that's something that I can either point you to or we could address during the executive session. Um, is it safe to assume that um, the percentages in that chart uh, could just be applied to those rate increases that were done mid-year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you talked about uh, uh, there are 44 different ways that MVP is trying to uh, <coughs> keep costs down while at the same time uh, guaranteeing quality for your uh, subscribers. And I'm curious uh, if the designation of a particular procedure uh, comes into that discussion. And let me give you an example. Uh, you've probably seen a number of ads on TV for a product called Colaguard. Mm -hmm. And Colaguard is I think 90 to 92 percent uh, effective. A colonoscopy is 97 percent effective. If you talk to primary care physicians, um, a number of them will tell you that even though, um, because there's no family history and uh, the health status of uh, a patient that is seeing them, they still may not recommend that lower cost alternative because of the way um, it's treated in its classification. So for example, a colonoscopy um, is a screening measure and is protected under Vermont statute and you have to treat it one way. Um, and what I'm told is that patients have gone for the lower cost uh, option, which is the colocard, because they don't have to take a day off from work and, do everything for the prep and everything else. But if it comes back that um, there's something that's found, the second colonoscopy that is then necessary um, gets treated as diagnostic rather than screening. And so it's a huge out-of-pocket cost to the, the Vermont patient. And so that uh, primary care doctors are reluctant to go to the step of going for the least cost alternative in the beginning because they know that in a small percentage of cases, it could be very expensive to their patient in the long run. So I'm wondering if you have those discussions. That would be something that's discussed at 
by our clinical team in any of those kind of discussions. I mean, I'm happy to provide follow-up if, if I can go back to the clinical team and understand if those conversations are taking place and what those conversations are. That would be very helpful. Um, you talked about uh, New York State not using RBC, but uh, using uh, uh, reserves for premiums. And you talked about the 12.5% in New York. They're currently at 14 and a half. Um, how does New York treat um, TPA or ASO arrangements? In terms of um, measuring their how they how they account for the 12 and a half percent. Well, ASO and self-insured generally falls under a different legal entity, and um, how that is at, how their premiums or their so basically the ASO client is only paying us um, administrative fees. How that is actually coming into the calculation, or if it's part of the calculation, I would have to follow up with the New York regulator, regulator to understand exactly what they're measuring. So um, to the extent that they're only pulling in our fully insured business, the way that my that MVP team has communicated back to me is it's 12.5% of our fully insured premiums. Now, I don't know if they've taken that for granted or with a grain of salt and how ASO the implication has been that ASO is not included in that figure, but I would have to confirm that with either our financial team or New York State to, to be 100% confident. Thank you. Um, you've said a couple of different times that uh, New York book of business is in decline, not is increasing, but it's a small percentage of your overall business. If there was similarly uh, a Vermont decline, um, but a large increase in New York business, would you come in with a reduced administrative cost in, in that scenario? What we do is we, we make a projection of a total dollar projection of what it's going to cost to run our business in the upcoming year. I'm really oversimplifying it, but that's generally what we're doing. And then, to, and then we're, we're looking at it relative to our overall membership with some, you know, obviously look at it. How are we operating? What are, what are we actually spending in Vermont versus New York, et cetera? In an extreme scenario, if we assume that our membership doubled, um, which enterprise-wide, which won't happen, but just for scenario sake, um, you would have a membership. You would be taking the same total dollar figure or proportionally increased for variable cost divided by a much larger base. I would anticipate in that instance we would have a reduction in the PM, PM admin. Um, if it's small, we still have to account for projects that we're undertaking, like updating technology and just other adjustments that we have to pay. There were some questions earlier about the Ambulatory Surgery Center. Uh, are you aware that the Green Mountain Care Board is in receipt of a letter from MVP um, stating that uh, the reimbursement uh, for procedures being done there for MVP subscribers is going to be um, below that of uh, hospitals. I am not aware of that. Okay. Uh, are you aware that um, the estimated cost savings to the system is three million dollars from the opening of the surgery center? I'm not. So, if those two things that I said were accurate, and that is the case, would there should there be a, a small reduction in your filing to indicate those cost savings? If the contracted rates that we're able to negotiate are lower than an outpatient, outpatient hospital setting and we can drive utilization there, then I would agree that we would have an adjustment to our filing if that information was known.
for uh, any redirect and, and cross on redirect. Does that make sense? That's fine. I'm happy to take a shorter break. Or whatever. Why don't we make that decision after we finish with the executive session? How long, how long the break is. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to, for people who want to leave and not have to come stand outside the room for the executive session. I'd say, I'd say we're weaving in one for finish the questioning of this witness. So, Member Yusufur uh, has some questions about, um, I believe it was Exhibit 3A, which the board has uh, granted confidentiality for. Under the board's rate review rules, uh, we have an obligation to omit references to these materials in the records of the public deliberations and take other appropriate measures to ensure confidentiality. Um, since this is a uh, public meeting, um, we would need to go into executive session to discuss this. Uh, the applicable statute, 1 VSA 313A, allows the board to go into executive session to discuss records that are exempt from public inspection copy under the Public Records Act. Um, procedurally, the board needs to make a motion. A motion would need to be made um, to go into executive session uh, indicating specifically what the purpose is and um, questioning would be limited to this document and not go outside of that. So can that, I have one more document? Yes, good. It's going to be um, Okay, so two documents, Exhibit 3A and Exhibit 5. Yeah, uh, tab 5, page 8. Which is not actually confidential. Thank you. 
motion here. I can do the motion. Uh, I move that we go into executive session to discuss exhibits 3A and exhibits 5, specifically the confidential information contained therein, uh, for the reason that we have a duty under the statute to provide confidentiality for those items. Is there a second? Second. Can all in favor signify by saying aye? Aye. aye. Opposed? So the board has decided to go into executive session. Um, we would need in the room, I believe, obviously, um, healthcare advocate and their attorneys, um, our staff, LME. I um, don't believe anyone else is necessary, so if everyone else could please leave the room. Um, that includes, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you can shut off the recording. We are going to continue our recording and uh, continue the transcription. Um, as we've also noted in the past, uh, insurance regulation is state-based uh, so that um, every uh, state is responsible for those companies that are not set within that state. Uh, in this case, uh, there are the regulators in New York. Um, so New York will uh, perform substantially similar examination and analysis procedures in all other states. Uh, and like all state regulation, we will rely on New York for those companies in the state we rely on New York uh, for NBP's analysis. Um, with respect to this year's solvency opinion, uh, it's, it's relatively similar to the prior year, and I know we've read some of this already, but I'll just read the final paragraph. Um, based on the entity wide assessment above and contingency wide assessment. Entity wide assessment above and contingent on GMCD actuary's findings that the proposed rate is not adequate, and DFR's opinion is that the proposed rate will not have a negative impact on um, there are a couple of reasons why that is similar to previous years. Uh, one is just the overall footprint of MVP's business in Vermont, um, relative to its full of business that we discussed previously. It is around 5%, which is relatively small. Um, and also, we have not received any solvency related concerns or communications thereof from New York Department. That's, that's uh, what I have so far. Um, I'm going to keep it short, and we're going to be short on time. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Mr. Carter, do you have questions for this one? I, I do. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Lucy, you're, you're, the, you're an insurance and examiner and analyst for the department, correct? Yes. Do you have your CPA? I do. And if you would, I think you have in front of you Exhibit 10, which is your the, the, the letter from DFR, correct? Yep. And you're adopting that letter as your testimony on behalf of DFR, correct? Correct. If you please read on the first page of that exhibit yep. the sentence under summary of opinion, please. The proposed rate filed by MVP negatively impact insolvency and company otherwise needs from our financial licensing requirements for a former insurer. Do you stand by that opinion, correct? Correct. Okay. Would you please read on page two, there's a heading, MVPHP insolvency opinion, and then there's three bolts. Do you see that? Yes. Would you please read uh, the three bolts? DFR has been in communication with MPPHP's primary solvency regulator in the New York Department of Financial Services and has not learned of any solvency concerns. Further, MPPHP currently meets Vermont's foreign insured licensing requirements. Finally, in 2018, all of M1 holding company's operations in Vermont account for approximately 4.8% of its total premium spread. DFR has determined that operations for a little risk to the policy. Nonetheless, advocacy of raising contributions to surplus are necessary to all 
sure. Exhibit 10, yep. under the heading background, yep. there's a paragraph that starts DFR, and that has three sentences. I would ask you to read the second and third sentences, please. Whether the insurer is solvent is more complex than simply determining whether any given moment the insurer has more assets and liabilities. Rather, it is an intricate analysis of many factors to discern how close or far away from the solvent the insurer is and what direction it will move in the future. And that, that's what DFR did this year, reviewing it, recognizing you're relying on the New York regulators as well. Yes. Thank you very much. Does DFR do any independent analysis of any of these sovereignty? Um, we receive the financial statements, so I review those at a high level. You review the financial statements? At a high level, yeah. But, but, but DF, you or DFR staff people don't do any independent analysis, correct? We don't do a full-blown analysis. No, but the New York Department does that. And, and you don't go behind the... Uh, annual statement. Pardon? You, you don't, you, you, you review the annual statement, you don't go behind the annual statement. Uh, I, I might look at the, the basic financials um, and then I would most likely look at the uh, supplemental health care exhibit um, and the MLR calculations just to see if those would affect Vermonters if there would be a refund. Okay, so you're, you review what's filed with New York and filed with HHS. Filed with the NAIC, I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry, and filed with the what? And filed with the NAIC. Um, do you do any type of analysis where you attribute a certain amount of uh, MVP's capital to Vermont? Yeah. And uh, you, you say in your solvency opinion, the first bullet on page two, um, that you've been in touch with the primary regulator in New York and they didn't have any solvency. Did they tell you that if this rate increase was not approved in full, that they would have solvency concerns? They did not say that. Did they tell you if this, if, the, if no rate increase was approved, that they would have solvency concerns? No, they did not say that. Did they tell you that if a decrease is approved, they would have solvency concerns? No, they did not say that. No questions. Okay. Any other questions for Jessica? One question, um, which Jesse, you may not be able to answer, so feel free to just say that. Uh, are you, do you know the status of MVP's form filing, it's specifically the goal plan that's being revised? No, that would be raised the form section, so I don't, I'm not involved in that. Okay, thank you. Would you like to see that? Uh, yes, it, we, it would be great if you could give an update on the form filing when it's approved.
just one other question. I think you said that there was a, uh, every three to four years there's a deeper dive, more like an audit of the insured. When was the last time, or when is the next time that that's going to be done? Correct. Yeah. Um, I have to double check that. It's, the statutorily is every three to five years. Um, I can get back to it, I'm not exactly sure. Right. that I do, but then we talk about them in great detail to make sure that we're consistent. 
between the two filings as well as making sure that we're accounted for all of the market-wide changes that need to happen. You mentioned the term SERF. Could you explain a little bit what SERF is? Yes. SERF is the NEIC's platform for the submission of rate filings, and it's the way we communicate um, with the carriers to ensure that um, all of it is available via public record uh, so that there's transparency through the process. And when you are reviewing um, a health insurance filing and you are assisting the board, what is it that you are assisting the board with um, in terms of evaluation? So our charge to the, to, is to help the board determine if the rates uh, that have been uh, submitted are reasonable. And how we go about that is look at all of the underlying assumptions to build up to the rate as well as the starting point and ensure that they've been properly supported that the support appears to be reasonable and um, that they have accounted for all of the pieces that they need to with it. And when you're making your determination about whether you believe rates to be reasonable, are there certain criteria that are defined by the professional guidelines or in the state statutes that you're looking at? Yes, we have a lot of guidance regarding rates. Some are at the federal level, some are at the state level, and we have to abide by those. We also, from um, the actuarial profession, we have standards of practice, and we call actuarial standards of practice, or ASOP, that we have to follow as well. Those provide us some guidance that is a little bit more specific to our role to make sure that we are accounting for all the pieces that we need to, to do so. And um, so after a company is filing their information into SERP, how do you go about getting more information to you get it during the review? Typically it begins with an inquiry letter that we send through SERP uh, to each of the carriers. We give them a defined time frame to respond so that we can get our responses back and we have that back and forth several times throughout the process. Okay. And that was through this filing as well? Yes, it was. And how long do you have to review a filing from the time it's submitted to the board? We have 60 days. And what happens at the conclusion of the 60 days? Uh, we have to submit a final uh, report uh, that becomes publicly available to all the parties. And is it your understanding that that 60 days is a statutory deadline? Yes. So talking about today's rate filing, uh, what was your role in the this review? My role was a peer reviewer of the filing itself, so I took a deep dive alongside Josh Hammerquist to make sure that we understood all of the underlying reasons for the rate increase and asked uh, sufficient questions to make sure that we were in agreement or if there were any disagreements where we landed with the carrier. And were you involved in writing the actuarial report for the time? Yes. And is that in the nine? Yes, I'm just going to that. Now, on page 2 of Exhibit 9, you'll see that there's a paragraph labeled standard of review. Is this uh, your standard of review, or is this the board's standard of review? This is the board's standard of review. And the standard of review is from the statute? Yes, it is. And what is LMA's standard of review? Our standard of review incorporates some of the portions of the board's standard of review. Uh, ours is defined through ASOP 8, where we are evaluating whether the rates are excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. Sorry, did you have you defined ASOP? Yes, actually, that was standard of practice. Thank you. I missed that. And how do you determine whether a rate is excessive according to the actual standard of practice? The actual standard defines excessive as having rates that are charged that exceed the amount that are needed to pay for claims, admin, taxes, fees, and a reasonable contribution to reserves of profit. And how is adequate defined? Adequate is very similar, except it kind of takes the opposing view where we are assessing whether the rates are sufficient to cover the claims, admin expenses, taxes, regulatory fees, and reasonable profit. And how is the term unfairly discriminatory defined? Unfairly discriminatory is, is defined as charging rates to a specific uh, 
a cohort of individuals that is not supported by their expected cost or not supported by federal or regular, other regulatory guidance. And earlier this morning, we heard some testimony briefly from MVP about affordability. Um, just to be clear, did l and &E review this filing for affordability? We did not. And are there actuarially defined standards for affordability? There is not. So moving to the language in your memo at various points around this, you may say that the carrier's assumption is reasonable and appropriate. Could you just give a little explanation as to what it means when you say it's reasonable and appropriate? Uh, sure. We use that term to basically state that it is not excessive, not inadequate, and not under the discriminatory. When we make a recommendation, it's typically because it has violated one of those in our opinion. So moving to your recommendations, which I believe are listed back on page 15. Yes. Um, could you uh, give a brief um, overview of, before we go into each specific one, could you just sort of skip to the end and um, just tell us what the ultimate projected rate increase would be of all of your recommendations for implementing? Yes, MVP's initial rate increase was 9.4%. If all of our recommendations were, were taken into account, then the rate increase changes to 10.5%. Okay. And just to be clear, we heard some testimony this morning about um, budget submission information, uh, updated information since hospitals submitted their budgets. Is that is there any recommendation in the master that included within the recommendation of 10.5? There is not. And we can circle back to that in just a bit. I'm going to walk through the rest of these, but I'll start from the top. Um, so what is the medical trend that MVP originally filed as described uh, on page 5? The medical trend as filed, the allowed medical trend, is 4.2%. And what is the basis of the unit cost trend assumption for this file? The unit cost trend assumption is in fact the 4.2%. It is accounting for the changes in the hospital contracts between the two groups. And earlier this morning, there was some testimony about an error that was discovered as part of this during the review. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about your questions to MVP and what the result of those conversations were? Sure. As part of our review, we want to ensure that the unit costs assumed within the filing are matching the hospital budget process, since it is well defined within the Green Mountain Care Board's hospital budget process. So we always ask them to itemize that by facility. In performing that, they recognize that they, the carrier, need to recognize that they had accidentally used the initial submission of trends rather than the final approved and ordered unit cost trends. So turning back to page 15, then that would be the first bullet point. Yes, we recommend that they do, in fact, reflect the order unit cost increases, which reduces the premiums by about 0.9%. And do you have any other recommendations regarding unit cost trends? Yes, as we've discussed earlier today, uh, some updated information regarding the hospital budget process has, since it has begun has, has been published in the form of narratives. That typically happens every year, so we were anticipating that happening again. Uh, our recommendation is to the board is that the most up-to-date information be used uh, with finalizing and, and producing the order. And have you had an opportunity to review these submissions for this year? Yes. And have you had an opportunity, well, it sounds like you've had an opportunity then to review hospital budget submissions and draft orders for past years as well. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, let's say just for the last three years, what's been the relationship between the budget submission rate as, as they are proposed and the final budget order from the board? The final budget order from the board is typically lower than the original submission. 
submissions from hospitals. And you heard some testimony this morning from MVP about what their assumption is uh, based on the budget submissions as they, as they are now. And do you have an opinion on MVP's assumption? I do not have a formal opinion because we have not seen uh, the, the breakdown. However, we did an, an, an independent calculation as well, and our figure uh, closely matches the 0.5% that uh, Mr. Lombardo quoted earlier. We would like to see the backup of that. Uh, so we do agree that if the proposed trends were incorporated, that would be the right change. You mentioned um, independent calculation, and I realized that we didn't cover something with earlier. Uh, when you're reviewing a filing, do you do independent calculations on everything that's submitted, or are there some instances when you are simply checking the calculations that the carrier has done? We typically do a mixture of both. Uh, the bigger an assumption is, or the greater impact is, we will typically review what the carrier has submitted, but also perform our own independent analysis to ensure that uh, either using a different methodology or using different backup data that we come to a similar uh, conclusion. So turning to the other portion of the medical trend, uh, what is the basis of the utilization trend in this filing? The initial utilization trend filed by MVP was 0%. Uh, they have performed an analysis where they looked at a closed cohort due to their very recent large increase in membership. They didn't want to include the newer members because they didn't have as much uh, history of data on those individuals. This proved to be very volatile in its, uh, in its results. And so they uh, determined it was inconclusive and filed a 0%, which is what they've done since 2014. And do you agree with that assumption? We do not agree with that assumption. Could you expand on that? We performed, given the results of their analysis and the credibility issues that they were experiencing, we determined that a market-wide study would be helpful. So we gathered confidential data from both carriers in the market to do a market-wide scan of the utilization. We came up with some results that can be seen on page seven of exhibit nine of our report. Um, these were all showing non-zero positive trends. So we felt like that it was appropriate to make an adjustment. Our recommended range for the market is having a utilization trend between one and four. For MVP, we have recommended a 1% utilization trend, and that was based on all of the data we are reviewing, not just the market. We recognize that there is a difference between the populations covered between MVP and Blue Cross, um, and that MVP's specific data has shown some downward trend uh, in their uh, in their past, but that in 2018, both carriers did experience an increase, which we felt should be reflected, but maybe not to the same extent as the high end of the range, which was four. Thank you. I'm going to move back to page 15 again. So moving on to the next bullet point, we're talking about HP and morbidity impacts. Could you explain a little bit about association health plans? Have you heard a bit about this morning? Yes, Mr. Lombardo's summary was quite good. He outlined that uh, in, in the last year, AHPs have been allowable again, which allows small groups to get together to create a larger group uh, called Association Health Plan and to seek coverage. This, there's been a lot of changes over the last six months and even last month on this issue with DFR's bulletin saying that in 2020 these plans will not be allowed to renew. So given that information, MVP said that they are no longer requesting the uh, rate increase of 0.8% for this particular 
And what is your recommendation for our day? Our re recommendation is to remove the AHP morbidity load on claims, which would reduce the subjective premiums about 0.8%. Moving on to discussion about the risk adjustment. Could you briefly explain what makes risk, the risk adjustment calculation so challenging? The risk adjustment calculation is challenging from a carrier perspective because it requires them to have knowledge of the other carriers in the market that is confidential, such as their risk scores and risk profiles of their populations. Therefore, they aren't very easily able to understand their position in that particular calculation. Additionally, for the 2020 calendar year, CMS is making changes to the risk adjustment formula. So they're changing some coefficients or weightings for some of the particular diagnoses. And that was also producing some question marks for each of the carriers as well. And in terms of the timing um, of the CMS, the CMS risk adjustment calculation, could you explain a little bit more about um, the information comes in and at what point carriers can be sure they know that they're looking at? Yes, during the, the filing here in Vermont was due roughly around May 11th, and the risk adjustment calculation payment transfer information comes out at the end of June. So it's kind of right in the middle of our uh, review period, um, which proves challenging because that's not too far away from the 60-day deadline that we discussed earlier. And it makes it challenging to have a quick turnaround on that type of information. So to mitigate that over the past couple of years, we have requested the information that they provide to CMS individually so that we can provide a preliminary calculation earlier in the process. We typically provide that to them sometime in May so that they can provide us with an assessment um, of how they're going to change their rates and how, what rate impact that would have earlier in the process. And after having done that work, does Eleni have a recommendation regarding risk adjustment? Yes. So after performing that work, we also did perform um, an analysis on what the 2020 coefficient change would be. And if you combine those two adjustments, we recommend that MVP's rates will increase by 1.5%. And moving on to our last bullet point, uh, the recommendations on page 15, changes to actuarial value. Um, as we discussed briefly a bit earlier and in this morning's testimony, there's an outstanding issue with one of the MVP's non standard pool plans. Uh, I'm sorry, what did, I didn't hear the, I'm sorry. Outstanding uh, issue with one of the MVP's non standard gold plans. Thank you. Could you explain um, where things stand now from your perspective? Our recommendation was based on a correspondence um, a few weeks ago. It's my understanding there's still some loose ends to be tied up here in the next week or so. Uh, I don't know that if that will have a material change, but we do have an estimate as of a couple of weeks ago that those changes to the plan will reduce the overall projected premiums by about 0.2%. The recommendations that we've gone through so far have been recommendations involving a change to uh, that would have a rate impact. And I just wanted to touch on one more recommendation um, that we have listed here, and that's about the new high cost member program. Yes. Could you tell us about your recommendation with regard to that? Yes, Mr. Lombardo testified already to what the high, new high cost program is. And we just recommend to be compliant with instructions that the that assumption be included under the net reinsurance section rather than the risk adjustment section that they put it under the in the original file. And to be clear, will that have an impact um, on rates? No, it will not. So let's just briefly turn to contribution to reserves. In your analysis for your report, do you review for solvency and contribution to reserves? Yes, we do. And um, is it your understanding that TFR is the, has the primary responsibility for reviewing for solvency? Yes, they do. And did you get confidential information, information reviewing for the company's solvency? 
Yes, we did. And do you find the company's assumption of a 1.5% contribution to reserve to be reasonable and appropriate? Yes, we do. So with the recommendations that you have outlined in this report, uh, do you find this uh, finally excessive? Yeah. Is it inadequate? It is not. And is it unfairly discriminatory? It is not.
As an actuary, you aren't influenced by public opinion. That doesn't enter into your calculus, does it? And that objectivity is illustrated in Exhibit 9. If your opinion is that MVP's approach on a particular issue is reasonable or appropriate, you've said so, haven't you? That's right. And that's indicated in the exhibit, correct? Yes. And if you don't agree with MVP, you say so, correct? That's right. And you recommend a change? We quantify the change, yes. Even if your recommendation results in a higher rate than even MVP is requesting in any given year, correct? That's right. Fire at the baseball game, you call them as you see them, don't you? That's correct. And the percentage rate increase that you're recommending this year, 10.5, is what you believe the board should adopt, correct? I think the board should adopt 10.5, but there are a few items that are still outstanding. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, you heard uh, Matt uh, Stonebardo's testimony regarding a 0.5% increase relating to the July 16th completed proposed budgets of the hospitals that were posted. That's right. And that's the most recent data we have as we sit here today, correct? That is correct. And it sounds like you concur with the calculus where they came to a 0.5% change, but you want to confirm and see their back. Is that right? That's right. Last year, when this issue came up, no, it's not saying the line, numbers line up, just coincidentally, MVP, similar situation on hospital budgets. They came up with a 0.5, and you reduced that to 0.2, relying on historical data. Do you recall that? Yes. Have you done that this year? I have not had an opportunity. Based on your experience, do you expect that, the, that if you do that, there will be a difference of opinion? It won't be 0.5? I do expect there to be a difference of opinion. Do you expect it will be in the range of, of 0.2, or do you know? I would say 0.2, 0.3. Thank you very much. Now, last year, we were in respect to disagreement about how to approach that. Uh, you didn't have the benefit of uh, knowing uh, that the, the board in early 2019 made a change to the hospital amounts that they could charge, correct? That occurred, right? Okay. Uh, but you're familiar with that occurring this year? Yes. So do you believe you can predict with 100% certainty that the board is going to reduce uh, reduce uh, from the proposed budgets? No. And this year you're recommending an increase above what MVP is originally filed, correct? Yes. So, uh, with all the numbers, the variables, and issues that are in MVP's report and in your good report, uh, they're at 11%, and you're at maybe it's 10.7 or 10.8, we're not sure, but close, correct? That's right. And that was the only issue of disagreement this year, the, the hospital budget issue, right? Yes. And you heard uh, Mr. Lombardo's testimony this morning? I did. I don't believe he testified this afternoon. And MVP agreed with all of your recommendations on page 15 of your report, correct all the bullets? Yes. And you've heard that uh, Mr. Lombardo indicated he's also a member of the American Academy, right? Yes. And you know that uh, Eric Bachner, who works with Mr. Lombardo, also signed the amendment finally, correct? Yes. So if I count that up right, that's five action groups, correct? Three from Melanie, two from MVP. That it recommended a 10.5% increase. The caveat that MVP would say go to the 11%, uh, and Melanie would say maybe go to 10.7, 10.8%. We're not sure yet. Is that fair? Fair That's summary? Right. But they all agree on the increase over the 9.4, correct? Yes. Uh, would you agree with me that? Uh, 
five edge better than one? Yes. And that multiple very smart people uh, have all agreed with the proposed rate increase uh, with this caveat about 10.7 or 10.8 versus 11, correct? Yes. I want to ask you a little bit about administrative costs. Please go to page 13. Page 13, the exhibit. And there's a number 13, changes in administrative costs. Do you see that? Yes. The first paragraph. The, read the third sentence, please. Because the premium is also increasing from the 2019 exchange filing. I think I might be on the wrong page. Bear with me a second. Oh, I'm sorry. I said the third sentence. I think you're reading the fourth sentence. I tricked you. So could you please read the third sentence? The overall rate impact is a decrease of 1%. And you reference the 42 p.m. p.m. in the first sentence. Do you see that? Yes. And then in the next paragraph, in the second sentence, you say, these costs have fallen substantially since 2013 when they were 46.57 p.m. p.m. You see that? Yes. You stand by that statement? Yes. And then in the second paragraph, would you read the last sentence, please? In light of the steps taken by MDP to reduce administrative costs over the recent years, the assumed administrative 2020 costs are reasonable and appropriate. So it's your opinion as an actuary of the Green Mountain Care Board that MPP has substantially reduced administrative costs over recent years, correct? Correct. Let's go to uh, unit trend on page five. Unit cost trend. Uh, we reviewed with interest your reasonableness. 
insurance checks, which are referenced in the second and third paragraphs under section 15 on page 14. Do you see that? Yes. Would you explain what you did here, please? Yes, we utilized the publicly available data from the URTs to assess where the contribution to reserve figure landed relative to the other bodies for the prior two years. And what did you find? We found that the average submitted CTR was 2.95% and the median was 3.15% and that MVP's assumption of 1.5% would rank as 629 out of the 777 files. So for um, it's the first year, for 2019, 82% of the filings were higher than the 0.5%, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Right. And for uh, 2018, in that next paragraph, 79% of the filings were higher than 1.5%, right? That's right. Do you know on that, I'm visualizing a curve, uh, what percentage uh, was uh, at 1% or less? As an actuary, you want to be conservative in considering CTR so you can set aside sufficient money, correct? Correct. As an actuary, you don't want to set aside too much or too little, correct? That's correct. And you don't want to be an outlier on that bell curve. Yeah. Um, I want to, you were asked about medical utilization trend. I just want to go to that briefly. If you go to page 15, just for point of reference, Bullet three, that's the medical utilization trend conclusion, which would increase the rates by approximately 1.5%, correct? Correct. And you heard more questions about this medical utilization trend just before the lunch break, correct? Correct. Okay. If you go to the bottom of page six of your report, please. sentence that starts because. Could you read that sentence, please? Because of the atypical results produced by NPP's analysis using their own data, Emily analyzed utilization trends by using market-wide utilization data, i.e. a combination of utilization data with both QHP carriers. So Emily used more data, correct? Correct. And that was appropriate in your opinion, correct? Yes. And you stand by this conclusion, don't you? Yes. If you go back to page 15, please. So Melanie makes a recommendation on a variety of issues to, to modify uh, NDP's proposal, correct? Correct. Would you agree with me that all these issues are interrelated? They all impact the final number? Yes, they're all interrelated. There's some pluses, there's some minuses, but they all impact that final number, correct? Correct. Thank you very much.
that's an overstatement. Is it your purpose is to assist the board in determining whether or not the rate is excessive or not, whether or not fairly discriminatory, correct? I mean, we're assisting the board by providing them information regarding the filing. They make the determination on all of those pieces, but we do provide them information. They make the determination on all those pieces, right? But, right. but, but, you, but your expertise is limited to whether or not the rate is excessive or not, whether or not fairly discriminatory, correct? That's correct. Um, I take it that you found that the 9.4% increase proposed by MVP would produce inadequate rates? That's correct. Um, you know Mr. Lombardo, right? Yes. Mr. Lombardo is a competent actuary, correct? Yes. Credential actuary. That's correct. Why would MVP submit an increase to submit a proposed rate that produces inadequate rates? We had more information than he did. Based on his knowledge, he did submit a rate that was adequate. But based on more information, we determined that it was, that it was potentially inadequate. I'm sorry, you determined that what? It was potentially inadequate because we had more information. Potentially inadequate.
was actually unacceptable. Based on the information that they had, no. So you chose a one percent trend rather than the, rather than a zero percent trend, correct? Correct. Okay. Can you show me where that is in your chart on page sixteen? Claims over $100,000. Um, 
to ensure that they are not overreacting to large claimants um, and to smooth out their experience period data so that it's not um, impacted by large claimants. Do you know, is, the, is, is that methodology typical among companies? Yes. Do any companies use the actual rather than the, uh, the, the accepted? Very rarely, I wouldn't recommend it because then in some years you could have a great increase uh, due to one claimant that may or may not be around in the next time period. Sure, but you haven't seen that. Have you seen that type of increase here? Can you rephrase? What do you yeah. what type of increase? Have, have you seen a huge increase uh, with an MVP claim that would make it uh, improper to do the analysis based on the actual rather than the expected. They've always performed this calculation to smooth out the data. They've always done the expected. Correct. Um, can you turn to the top of page 10? Of exhibit 9? Yes, please. That chart there shows five years of the average age factor, correct? That's correct. Okay, and what is the average age factor measure? The average age factor generally measures the average age of the population, and that's associated with a, a rating factor for that age. Okay, so does that mean that the average age factor uh, goes down that the average age goes down? Roughly, yes. Okay. And all things equal, then, claims you go there? Yes. Okay. And you see that, you see that, in fact, uh, the average age factor does go down, right? Yes, in that chart. But MVP has used the same age factor, despite the fact that the average age factor has been going down, correct? Right? That's correct.
Could you explain the risk adjustment methodology that MVP employed in this original project? Not that I'm aware 
unit cost increases? Uh, and the rate I'm defining is, is the actual revenue to Vermont hospitals from Medicare. I can give you the numbers if you want. In fact, we've already. The reason I ask is I did believe, I did believe that uh, the UVMC does provide a breakout for commercial alone and its subsidiaries. So that we do have broken out. But the reason I'm careful for data, as we have commercial data, mm -hmm. we have Medicare data, right. and we have. Um, like Medicaid data, and it all holds up to the entire amount of NPR. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, in, in, in the hospital budgets. Um, right, I just think they break it out, which is help, the only reason that it's helpful. I think they're the only Break it out by so. hospital. Well, right, it's broken out by hospital, and they have their facility, and they do break out what commercial is versus the other pieces, the others. What I understand, don't, but that they actually did, and since they're such a large percentage, that does get a little bit of weight in what the numbers that they're using, if that answers your question. Well, I don't know if it answers it, it just means to me that there's some noise in that comparison. That's true, yes. Um, thank you, Jackie. I have a question in two parts, actually. Um, given the submissions of both carriers, I'm wondering if you've done
a little bit, it seems to me from what I've read, on the mental distribution of a higher impact on low risk rotten members. You know, that impact is higher there than on the high risk. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. How does that all play out? Right. And so in a perfect world, risk adjustment would match up one for one from a claims cost perspective, but it's not. And so CMS recognized that, and that's why they are have changes for the 2020 to better align. It had its greatest impact on those low claimants um, who are healthier, um, which obviously impacted the AP the most because that was, as you can see, that's where their, their burdens are. Um, and how we kind of handle that is we look at what the what the changes were to that risk adjustment so that we could better assess that from a global perspective. And we're hopeful that going forward that's going to start to match up one to one. And then this distribution will change primarily just due to premium differences between the two carriers. Again, low cost members tend to be more price sensitive because they're not really working with a doctor very closely on a particular diagnosis that they have, so they're willing to change PCPs versus somebody who's had a long-term illness that they can work with the same doctor that maybe isn't covered on their boat or if they make some nervous to switch because they don't know how that will impact their out-of-pocket costs um, due to the, the complexity of health insurance. So to see the shift really is going to be due to uh, premium changes most likely. And as those grow, so is I understood that thank you, I think. Um, one of the things that so this you know in the page 16 this, this distribution that you predicted of percentage of membership that obviously has changed from page two to page sixteen. So the factors that go into that uh, prediction are not only the rate changes within MVP but also the relative comparison to Blue Cross Blue Shield and how competitive each metal level is. Both of those factors weigh into your institutional predictions. Yes, and I, I wanted to look into that that figure here because oh, uh, so the numbers in the on page sixteen match the numbers that are here on page two. They're just in the second chart. So this is the 2019 changes. So those are based on 2019 membership. Match. And then the one, and I'm gonna have to, I'm just gonna have to look, yeah, because that's different up here. So maybe this is 2018 and this is 2019. There, this is not a prediction, these are actual. Oh, um, so I was actually, I thought you were, I thought you have a footnote. Okay, I thought this was a, based on the LNE recommended overall change, this is what you would expect in the percentage. No, that is to help us calculate the overall. Okay, so we can do an analysis that predicts the distribution of metal count based on. We have done that for you. <laughs> but we have not published that in our report. Okay, sorry for the confusion. No problem, thank you. But I will clarify that. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions. Yes. On um, page 16, um, can you say where the point, the negative point nine percent for the budget projection changes from hospital? Is that in a point nine three? So the, the um, LA, they eventually can resubmit it. Right, right. So like eight point four. So uh, we're going from eight point four to the ten point five. Correct. Right. Uh, that would be in. Lines two and line, well, no, I would say primarily line three because it's for 2019. Okay, so yes. And then just talking about risk adjustment, well, we've had a lot of discussion on risk adjustment. And because we're really, you know, two primary insurers in the state, do you really look at that as flipping between one to the other? So where we're seeing a one and a half percent increase on top of their 4.4. So, so when I look at any change 5.9% is due to risk adjustment. That's correct. Um, and so I'll come back to that part in a second, the 5.9, but the, the change that you're putting in of the 1.5, 
you're then offsetting that in process submissions so that the numbers tie out, is that correct? We are not recommending the such that we have them up there zero. That's really complicated because they have two separate projections for membership, and that's the figure is highly tied to how much membership that they have. And so we haven't done that direct comparison to make sure that we multiply up their projected membership as a PM PM and that, and that, that it actually matches up with zero. We have projected what we think or recommended what we think is the most appropriate figure for both of those and that it will be close enough on so, the PM PM text at this time. Yes, the intent I'm sorry, is that I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. The intent is that it pretty much balances. Correct. Okay. And then if MVP grows, if, if we do get more people coming into the um, buying insurance, and there's such a large risk adjustment on the PMPM, is that then correct? Assuming then, you know, they can't keep getting just the healthier people. I mean, it really has to kind of balance out, right? So how does that work? Because we're calculating on a PMPM. It's pretty significant, PMPM number in their rates, and right. as they get more people, that number would go down. Um, and then should we just correct that in next year? Yes, as they get more people, that number will go down. When you go to review the Blue Cross spike, then you can see, too, that their number is kind of done the opposite when you up. Um, it gets it's highly correlated, and that's why even a couple of years ago, when um, MVP had a really large amount of payable, but not many members, really, really high for them. Um, that number is going to continue to drop if membership continues to go up. Um, I also think, as we discussed earlier, that they can't continue to just get healthy members only, so that's also going to stabilize, which might bring, that will just kind of hopefully take it down across the board, since they are related to one another, such that MVP is not making such a big payment into the pool um, as well. Yep. That's all right. Thanks. Yeah, well, no further questions. Okay. Any regret? I just have one question, I think. Um, the HCA brought up um, the people who are currently enrolled in the 2019 AHPs. And I was wondering whether in your report you would address, if there's any, um, any calculation you've done to address the people who are possibly returning to the market Returning to the marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> um, returning to the marketplace from the 2018 AHPs. Thanks. No. And could you explain why that is? Right. So the 2018 is the experience period that is being utilized here, um, and there were not AHPs present during that time. So we're not anticipating anybody coming back on because they were already included in our experience period. The only thing that happened was they were moved from the rate, which is a 2019 rate, the impact of thinking that those individuals were moving. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, 
for in four ways. Uh, I'm Mike Fisher, I'm the Chief Healthcare Advocate, and uh, I'm going to to speak for a few moments um, and um, come from a bit of a different perspective than you've heard all day. Um, and speaking of all day, it's been a long day. We're all tired. Um, I'm tired. Um, I think I can be pretty brief. Um, and I want to recognize that I don't have anything to say today that isn't broadly understood by most Vermonters. Healthcare. It, uh, the cost of uh, buying coverage and getting care uh, is a barrier that prevents some people, some Vermonters, from getting the care they need. It's important, though, even though this is probably known, to take a few moments here to make sure that these it's said out loud in these proceedings, to, to, uh, to focus on um, and consider the consumer's perspective. The stress that Vermonters experience when they need care and don't know how they're going to get it and how they're going to pay for it is real. Affordability is a consideration of the consumer's ability to pay for coverage and care. Simply put, can Vermonters, can Vermont families reasonably get the care they need or the care their providers recommend and do things like put food on the table or eat their homes? And, can Vermont small businesses provide a meaningful health care benefit to their employees and survive given the margins of their business? We recognize, I recognize, that the board can't achieve full affordability in this rate plan. A 0% rate increase wouldn't achieve this. This means the question before us today is not if health insurance will be affordable to all Vermonters. The question is how many more Vermonters will be priced out of the ability to get the care they need. The push and pull of the financial well-being of Vermonters and the financial well-being of MVP healthcare in this case are competing pressures. The board has a tremendously difficult task in front of you uh, in considering these competing interests. I appreciate that. There's no easy answer. Yes, we need healthy carriers, and yes, we need rates that consumers can buy plans that they can afford to use. It's been interesting for me to listen today about um, uh, all the actuarial considerations. Um, without any consideration of the consumer, I think we need consumers in this uh, in order for this to work. Um, the ability of Vermonters to afford coverage is key to the success of healthcare financing. It's not a nice afterthought uh, after the experts have set the rates. To give an extreme example, none of us would celebrate a rate that was as actuarially sound as possible if only Warren Buffett and Bill Gates could afford it. It wouldn't work. According to the 2018 Household Health Insurance Survey, I believe that's Exhibit 17 uh, in your book today, 40% of us um, are uh, uh, under the age of 65 in the commercial marketplace are underinsured. 40%. Um, that number, by the way, four years earlier uh, uh, in 2014 was 27%, so it's, it's climbing. I know these proceedings are not about plan designs, um, but when premiums rise, more and more Vermonters are forced into plans with higher and higher out of pocket costs. Some of the people in that 40% category live day to day with the reality of what a $15,000 deductible means when they have loved ones who need care. Others may not be worried about out of pocket costs because they're healthy again. We all know what that game means. At the Healthcare Advocates Hotline, we get calls most days, every day, from Vermonters uh, with affordability concerns. But today, I'm going to focus my comments um, on, the, uh, on the comments that were submitted uh, to the board in the last few uh, days and weeks. Um, it's a, an interesting list of comments that have come in. To break them into a few themes, um, 
um, many people said uh, these rates are unaffordable. These rates will force us to drop coverage. Deductibles are also unaffordable. I don't go to the doctor because my fear because of my fear of the bill. Health insurance is our biggest household expense. This rate will hurt my business. This was said by employer and employees, by the way. Health insurance costs keep me from being able to put money into savings, retirement, and college funds. Health insurance increases are far outpacing wage increases in Vermont. This is unsustainable. I'm going to quote just two, I'm going to be very brief. Um, comment number 38, a uh, woman who identified herself as Amy said, monthly, monthly premiums plus high and ever increasing deductibles are, are already a huge financial burden at 20% of my gross income. Another increase without anticipated increase in income only makes this worse. I'm also a healthcare provider who accepts insurance and have not seen reimbursement increases across the board, making a premium increase request even more frustrating. Another commenter uh, recognized herself as a small business owner who owns a, uh, runs a development care home. She said, our family of four has no options for health insurance, but privately paying for it at about $1,600 per month. Yes. $20,000 a year. We'd like to save for college. We'd like to take a family vacation before our kids leave us. We'd like to pay our mortgage and save a bit for retirement. We fear going without, going without insurance, desperately trying to keep our family safe. How can anyone afford this? Another point um, of information that uh, I found interesting is that, that this year, Rutland Regional Medical Center in its hospital budget submission is requesting a 2.65% rate increase, increase effective October 1st. They indicated that this increase, this rate increase, directly relates to the increase in their free care program. Their need to provide free care has increased by $2.5 million from budget to budget. They report that they have not changed the eligibility of free care. Rather, this is a result of an increase in patients who have insurance but can't afford deductibles and co-pays. Nearly 48% of their free care is provided to patients who have some level of insurance. Um, I know you've heard me say something very similar to this before, and I'm sure you've heard many others say uh, very similar concerns. There's a risk that we become desensitized um, and distance ourselves from these expressions of fear and frustration. Let me put it another way. Um, while there have been times in my life where uh, I and my family have less income, I've never had to face the fear of being scared to death of what it would mean um, if I had a family member that needed care and I had no idea how I paid for it. I know about the pressures of affordability in my job, but only from a more distant perspective. For me, it was a really powerful experience. And I don't know if you've had the opportunity to do it yet, but I'm sure you will. But it's a powerful experience to take the time to read the comments that came to you in the last couple of Days. Yeah, some of them were cheeky. Um, some of them were not completely on target. But many of them were from regular Vermont, Vermont families doing their best, desperately wanting to root, and doing their best and desperately wanting to rule the game to get on the right chance. Thank you for your work on this. And thank you for your message. I do. Good afternoon, Mr. Fish. Good afternoon. Now, you're not an actuary, are you? I am not an actuary. That's all I am. What was there saying at the very beginning? I'm sorry, I didn't know. I said that. What were you saying at the very beginning? What are you saying at the very beginning? So 
Mike, you're a close uh, follower of everything that happens in the healthcare world. And you've seen a period that there have been very, very small increases in Medicaid, especially in Medicare. So would you agree that um, when a rate filing comes in that's higher than the medical inflationary rate, that um, government needs to take some responsibility? Absolutely. Thank you. Which is just to your point um, about becoming desensitized, I just want to assure you and everybody that you work with and speak with that at least I can say to you that I'm not desensitized. I hear it. Um, I hear it all the time that I'm out. If people hear that I want to be mad carefully, you can imagine what the next conversation is. Um, and I just want to assure you and everybody else that I know that we read all the public comments and we have a special forum uh, tomorrow night and we welcome those comments and I just want to show you that we are not sensitized and that we're listening. Okay. I would like to make a comment. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you wrote an op-ed a little while ago and uh, in it you said, but when a sizable portion of moderates can't afford to get their care, they need um, those same neighbors and policy makers to see the crisis. Um, and <clears throat> And then it, it went on to say, um, well, I, I assumed I was one of those regulators. And uh, I took a little bit of offense to it because um, you know that in my concurring opinion last year on this rate filing, the first sentence in that um, opinion was, I write separately, however, to discuss my uh, deep concern with the evidence presented as to the affordability of the proposed rates. And I went on and a fairly lengthy proposal um, that as a former finance committee, I think is a very uh, finance commissioner, I think it's a credible proposal. So, <clears throat> but in order to move forward on that, we need some help um, from the state entity to give us a number to work toward. And so when these plans were presented last February, I asked uh, the folks from, from um, DEPA, could they give us a number? Uh, and they said they would. Um, and then when, uh, uh, in June 7th, there was another meeting, and I asked again for the update, and, uh, and I still haven't received it. And for me, until I know what's, what the price tag is on something, it's hard to advocate for, except conceptually. So I'm just going to ask you, will you help get that number from DEPA uh, to understand so we can have a measurement of what a subsidy is above 400% of poverty to 500% of poverty um, below the 9.86% threshold. Um, there's a number there, and uh, if we knew it outside of this process, but if we knew it, um, we might be able to work collectively to solve some of these problems. So uh, on how do you engage in trying to get that number? It's a number of understanding sort of what it would cost to finance a, a reasonable slope. The way I would put a reasonable slope between 4 and 500 percent poverty um, uh, is a, a great activity, a uh, worthy activity, and I will engage in that. And I, I do want to say, um, hey, I, I, I put that desensitization of that recognition in my own terms. I, I, um, and, and I don't intend in any way to call anybody out as being insensitive or not re recognizing the, the needs of Vermonters. Um, I don't have the experience of knowing that fear and desperation, that, that panic. Um, um, one commenter said something very, very good. He said, uh, um, uh, stress, the, the, the financial stress of figuring out how to pay for care isn't conducive to anybody's health. Um, so um, um, I, I recognize the, uh, the tremendous work and the tremendously impossible box that you are all in. I think my, the main task I'm here to say is um, this is a balancing act. I don't know whether the right, I, I like the metaphor of the stone pile that you can't upset. 
Um, I don't know whether the face of that sum pile is appropriately the consumer or the actuarial analysis. I think it depends on your perspective a little bit. A little bit. But we need to have that. Do you have any developments? I do not. Okay. And the parties wish to make closing arguments? Brief, briefly, if that's appropriate. Okay. Yeah. So MVP has proposed 11% increase. LE and MVP agree on 10.5. Uh, and the delta between those is 0.5%. We've provided evidence on. L&E testified today they need to check the numbers themselves, but a fair inference would be it's going to be roughly 2.7 or 2.8, it depends. You'll see on that, you'll, you'll see that before you have a final decision, I presume. So after a multitude of factors and considering all the statutory criteria, the actuaries are virtually identical and in agreement. We've got two MVP actuaries, we've got three LE actuaries, they all agree. There's no contrary expert evidence supporting a different number. And considering the final number, we would respectfully request that the board consider the rate within what is actually sound and reasonable and statutorily adequate. I did mention this slide from Stack of Stones this morning and how the actuaries have found just the right balance to meet all the statutory criteria. We have information to consider all the statutory criteria. We would just ask that the board not pull a large non-actuarial stone from the middle of that stack and cause the rate to be inadequate and all those stones come out like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Four quick points. Number one, looking just at the actuarial analysis. There are all kinds of different methodologies, different types of analyses in connection with which the board has discretion in connection with, with which both the carriers and the LME were wrong last year. They were both wrong in raising the rates substantially because they assumed that zeroing, having a zero penalty for the individual mandate would make a difference. They were both wrong about what they did. There are many provisions in the analyses where judgment, uh, uh, where lots of judgment is allowed. So for example, they may choose, naturally they choose to use a straight average where the trend is downward. And it would make just as much sense to follow the downward trend to wait for most recent data more heavily. So on those, on those issues, the board has discretion and I think it should err on the side of trying to promote affordability to the maximum extent possible. On the other hand, if there, if there really is a hard number, for example, if Ms. Lee is right about risk adjustment, the, the uh, risk, their risk, risk adjustment methodology using hard numbers, objectively verifiable numbers, that's different than, than I would agree with LME that if it's a hard number, that uh, that is something that the board would be hard, hard pressed not to adopt. But the only the, the only hard number in the analysis, if Ms. Lee is right, is the risk adjustment number. All the others um, are subject to discretion. Third point, the company can't have it both ways. Either administrative costs are indivisible and total adjusted capital, that is, it's a solvency issue, that's indivisible. Or they're both separable. What MVP is trying to do is to say, well, because New York business is going, is, is uh, decreasing, Vermonters have to pay for that, what's going on in New York. But, um, but at the same time, even though MVP's total adjusted capital is, the, the rate increase here has essentially no effect on their capital, that MVP should still get the benefit. Vermonters should still contribute as much as New Yorkers to that. Those are inconsistent. Finally, after all the actuarial analyses are done, there's no question but that 
This is the only state in which affordability is a criterion. Ms. Lee was very careful to say she is not recommending that the board raise the rate by 10.5%. She is recommending that a 10.5% increase does not produce rates that are excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. But that's a far cry from recommending an increase of 10.5% because of the affordability criteria and other criteria in the section. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have a few procedural or follow-up items to discuss. Um, there were a number of questions that board members asked and Mr. Lombardo said he need to speak with people in the clinical department or contracting. Um, I think we need to follow up. I will follow up on behalf of the board uh, with those questions and I make sure we have them all in the clear to you. Um, would I assume it would be feasible to get those responses back prior to the due date for the briefs? Is that fair? Um, is it fair? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's how we did it last year. We'll, we'll make it happen. Um, uh, and I think you writing the questions down is very important. That's what we did last year because we don't want to, we have our notes, but if we misinterpreted what the particular board member was asking. If there is an issue uh, around timing, uh, yeah, I would confer with, with you on that if we have a hold up on things and data or something. Okay. And we do. Do have it wouldn't be ideal if we could have the ability to extend the period uh, to take additional information from the carrier. So we'll so we'll follow up all up with those questions and we can talk about timing. Um, if I understood correctly, we will be getting an amendment related to the change from the non standard goal plan to today or tomorrow. Right. Yeah, the expectation for the form submission would be today. Whether that impacts the rate filing, I don't know, but that will be filed with the form, so we'll probably get today. Okay. So we get an update on that today, um, I believe. And would you like us to submit that as a piece of evidence in this proceeding, whatever it is? Uh, I think it would need to be, yeah. Okay. It would be how we're asking. Um, I think there was a request uh, or I heard testimony uh, that Alan would like to see the calculation for the hospital budget 0.5%. So if you could provide that when you're able to. Um, and then I think Jesse, you had committed to notifying us when the forms are approved, correct? Or Emily? Okay. Did I miss anything? I believe. Um, as we did last year, and I don't mean to put work on the plate of l &E, but I think then they, we heard testimony that it might be 0 0.2, it might be 0 0.3, but they would actually uh, file something more certain on that. Yes, we will discuss um, putting their uh, calculations out there in our YouTube. Anything else before we adjourn?
that are going to be very concerned about what is happening right now are not here, but they really are here. Some of them don't know about it. So I can imagine some of them saying, um, and it, and DP is like the child that just turned 18. Hi, you grew up. Please just just leave. And they hear what these numbers are. Assuming you pass it, if you were to pass this kind of increase, no way. I don't see a lot. I see a lot of consumers are going to look at their income and think of this as an annual increase. Possibly. They don't know. This is part of what gets really scary. Because it's not just healthcare, it's across the board. What was it last year? It was a high amount. What did their income go up? Incomes don't go up by 5% a year, 6% a year. They don't go up by 11% a year. I can and I was actually toying with this. I want to go up there next January and ask them to pass a bill that puts in the minimum wage that it goes up automatically if healthcare goes up by 11%, the minimum wage goes up by 11%. Let's see how that goes across. But I also understand the point that the state of Vermont under funds their share. This does not help the situation at all. Um, it gets very complicated. No company sells solvency and affordability of a service if the solvency is theirs alone. They do, I'm not really, they're doing what they need to do. But that is more about what is the consumer perspective going to be? Is that what they're going to see? Is that how they're going to feel? What about them? Where are they in all this? Um, we do need more testimony about what Vermont's market is and what Vermonters can really afford versus this is the option they came in with for the wrong reasons as well as this. We need that other. As these rates go up like this, or even the possibility of going up like this, we need a better definition right from the start of what is our market that we can actually afford. We have the three comments here that even though I wrote them out, I am not going to say them. Um, they aren't bad, but they're not bad, but the sign of love is strong, and I thought I'd reread really them. Uh, so I do believe we need alternatives. I think we are getting at a very interesting point. This could be exciting or it could be a disaster. As these economic factors come into play and we start seeing these kind of costs, this is, if you're an inventor, if you're, if you're creative, you actually get excited over scenarios like this. Because you start thinking, wow, there's some real wiggle room to be creative and to see if I can do it better. And maybe more affordable and still, I mean, if, if, as an engineer, if I heard something like this, we'd be all over it. We'd be out there bidding and we would be like, hey, give us a shot at it. We can do this. I don't know that's true. It's so complex. But I think we're looking at that. We're seeing some really high numbers come in. We're seeing flat wages. And I think the real answer.
answer is people are going to say no. They want a better solution. They must have a better solution. They aren't going to buy it. And somebody out there is going to invent something. There's enough wiggle room now that very well could be better. I think that's a consumer perspective. Yeah. Um, from the consumer perspective, like I said earlier, we will have uh, a meeting dedicated tomorrow solely to comment from the public and based on the volume of written comments we receive, that can be fairly well attended. Um, so if there are no other members of the public who'd like to comment, um, I'm going to end the hearing today and turn it back over to the chair for closing the meeting. Thank you, Mike. Uh, everybody's eyes look a little bit heavy. But at this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. So moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We'll be back again tomorrow at 8.